Okay, hello everybody. Uh, welcome back. This is um, uh, Deck 11, Lecture 11 from Cinematography 1. Uh, I'm your professor, Michael Walsh. And uh, today uh, I want to start the conversation that we'll have over the next three uh, lectures in this series uh, about camera movement. Okay, so this is part one. Section 6.1 of Basic Camera Movement. And uh, before I get into it, let's just jump over to our uh, web courses here. And we'll take a look at what we've got uh, going on. Uh, for the next three weeks, we have Basic Camera Movement. So uh, today I'm going to go into the, um, the um, meaning and the um, accessibility of handheld mode. Uh, and then... Uh, movement uh, using the tripod uh, as camera support and then over the next couple of weeks we'll talk about dollies, sliders and jibs from a basic standpoint not uh, real big uh, extravagant equipment um, but the basic uh, uh, tools that you can use to achieve those types of translations and then the following week uh, I like to talk about gimbals and that's uh, usually a fun conversation so we'll look at um, a uh, couple of versions of uh, handheld stabilization, just basic units. Um, so today, uh, I'm going to start the conversation part one with just basic camera movement. And if we just check uh, on web courses and we look for the, uh, the um, supporting documentation to go along with this lecture, look for section 6.1 basic camera movement on your home page. And then if you scroll down on this page, you'll see uh, we have the readings associated with this lecture. Uh, we have The Art of Motivating Camera Movement by Laura Wells. This is a thesis document uh, that I've selected for you folks to have a look at. Um, you can download it under the downloadable PDFs. Um, it was um, created as a thesis uh, uh, white paper um, discussing the uh, the value of camera movement, the basic rudimentary function of camera movement. Uh, and so it's at a level that I thought uh, was a good place for us to start our conversation as well. Uh, I also have for you um, some uh, reading from the third edition of Cinematography Theory and Practice, um, uh, the chapter on camera movement. Okay, so that's the, uh, the brown book, the blue version, the blue-brown book as we call it. <laughs> And uh, the chapter is called Camera Movement. And then uh, as a, a further supplement, I have a, a PDF for you to take a look at as well. The Five Most Powerful Camera Moves in Cinema History. Um, that's an interesting article. Um, if you have a look at it um, online, it's from uh, the Premium Beat, folks at Premium Beat. And it's a, a great article just on um, the basics of camera movement. And it'll help you sort of get into the mode of thinking about translations, uh, the cinematic value of translations and the, uh, the dramatic uh, value of moving the camera, moving the lens throughout your, uh, your universe, throughout your story. Um, it has a, a neat illustration uh, from behind the scenes uh, of the feature film Jaws. So uh, look for that document on your downloadable PDFs as well. Um, the Art of uh, Motivating Camera is um, uh, an interesting paper. It's not too long, so uh, I think you could probably get it uh, get it read in a couple of chunks, maybe a couple of slow evenings at home, um, and just have a look at it. Um, there are some uh, references. Um, some of them are more vintage references, and some of them are more recent uh, references. Um, we have the Lord of the Rings mentioned here, the Legend of the Lost Arrow, the Evil Dead, uh, Super 8, um, and so forth. So uh, our author is going to make some uh, uh, some correlations for you, and then use these films uh, to illustrate those points. So I think it's um, it's a it's a it's a pretty good read. It's very interesting, and like I said, it'll get the conversation started. Um, and then, of course, uh, if I uh, open up our um, our lecture decks here. I want to point out to you uh, what's coming up in terms of your, um, your quiz uh, obligations at this point. So you'll have taken uh, your quiz four now uh, at this point. So quiz five is, um, is waiting in the wings. If I uh, shoot back over to um, 
web courses here really quick and just take a look at your uh, quizzes tab that I have open. So quiz five is going to uh, comprise the composition and framing um, materials uh, that we've discussed over the past couple of weeks now. Um, so this will be the, um, uh, the basis for your quiz five experience. 25 questions, timed as always, you'll have 30 minutes to complete that. Not too difficult. Uh, I'm really uh, simply interested in whether or not you're getting the basic concepts and um, uh, so we can move ahead with um, you know this exciting uh, chapter. It's my favorite chapter in the whole uh, semester is camera movement. Uh, I think that camera movement is um, uh, at the heart of the uh, cinematic art form. Um, it's, it's one of the aspects of uh, uh, cinema that uh, make it uh, uh, unique in its uh, art category. Um, so it's, uh, for me, uh, w one of the more uh, interesting and uh, amusing uh, sections to undertake. So um, let's get started with that. Um, you can see here I've got a, a, an illustration um, which is demonstrating some of the basic uh, translations that we're going to cover in the last few weeks here. And I've used that also um, as the uh, identifying uh, header for this section on camera movement. Okay, so there are six basic translations, okay. Um, uh, Ms. Wells talks about these translations in her document, um, uh, The Art of Motivating Camera Movement. Um, in my Cinematography 2 classes, we take a look at another uh, thesis white paper, um, which also discusses these uh, six basic translations. So if we think about moving the camera, um, you've probably heard the term translation before. You may have heard it in uh, one of your... Um, uh, one of your vector math classes, for instance. Um, it's simply um, a term that we use that refers to movement, but if we uh, talk about it in terms of translation, we're, uh, we are translating our frame from one point of view to another and revealing new information in the process. So the six basic translations that I want to get you thinking about and then get you thinking about the types of support that you can use to create these translations. We have the uh, dolly in and therefore dolly out. So the reciprocal movement would be out. So push in and pull out. We have the pedestal up or the crane up and crane down. Um, we have the tracking shot, which is a side to side or a lateral translation. Okay, tracking left, tracking right. Um, we have the pan and the tilt, okay, and then this last one is kind of falls under the category of autonomous camera movement. Uh, in this case, it's kind of a yaw maneuver. It's basically where we do maybe an active Dutch tilt like we talked about uh, in the previous uh, discussions, uh, but we incorporate that into a move on the camera's part to show some form of... Um, transfer of reality maybe from consciousness to uh, subconscious or from calm to uh, agitated, from reality to uh, fantasy, uh, from uh, awareness uh, to unconsciousness perhaps. Uh, you know, any number of those um, uh, meanings could be uh, inferred by that type of uh, movement. Um, so let's, uh, let's dive in and see, uh, see what we've got here. I want to cover a few basic points with you today. Um, I want to look at the basic principles behind camera movement. And then I want to talk about uh, pan, tilt, and zoom. Uh, and these are, uh, generally speaking, um, tripod skills. Uh, although we're also going to talk about handheld uh, camera movement. And what you're going to notice about handheld camera movement is that um, many of the translations that we use other tools to accomplish, for instance, pretty much any of these translations, you'll see there are specific pieces of camera support that we can use to get uh, specific uh, and controlled movement. Uh, you can also achieve all of these translations with a basic handheld uh, function of the camera. Um, so this week I want to start with uh, looking at handheld and then talking about the tripod because the tripod has been with us almost from the beginning of the uh, inception of the camera. So 
Uh, we'll talk about these, and, and this will be the foundation for our growing conversation now, which is going to last over the next two uh, to three weeks, uh, where we will start thinking about these translations with a variety of different tools. Okay, so let's start off by talking about uh, camera movement in its, in its essence. So the ability to move the camera is the most fundamental aspect that distinguishes uh, film and video from photography or painting or any other form of visual art for that matter. Um, we've seen uh, cameras uh, moving uh, as being much more than just going from one frame to the other. We're actually revealing information. So the movement, the style, the trajectory, the pacing, and the timing uh, in relation to the action all contribute to the mood and the feel of the shot. So through our translations, we can actually add we can add tension, we can add interest. We, as, as we isolate objects within a frame, we can create a, a, a focal point. Uh, we can create anxiety. We can create uh, relief by pulling out and, and opening up our field of view to a wider, more relaxed, calmer uh, composition. There are a number of ways that we can manipulate the tone of our narratives by incorporating camera movement or dynamic frame movement uh, within the context of our story. So this is very important. This is um, hopefully uh, the kind of concept that you can use um, effectively in taking your, uh, certainly your student films to the next level. And then you'll notice that, um, you know, any number of the commercially produced, uh, uh, professionally crafted uh, um, films, videos, documentaries, music videos, uh, and so forth, even videos to a certain extent, uh, you'll notice that the subtle and purposeful use of camera movement can uh, really sort of add a new dimension to the visual context of, of, of what's being revealed to you on the, on the, on the, on the screen. Okay, so um, camera placement uh, is a key decision in storytelling. Uh, where we place the camera and then from what point to what point are we going to uh, create our translation. And then we have to start developing a, a, a strong sense of um, preference in terms of um, uh, what angles offer the best point of view to reveal or explain the aspects of our story okay, to our audience. Okay, so here we go. So this is uh, the image from the, um, the article that you'll be taking a look at. So this is on the set of the original Jaws film, and it is uh, the, the director, Steven Spielberg, is talking to Roy Scheider, and this is a particular moment in the story, and this is where camera movement really helps to drive home the drama of the stories we're trying to tell. In this scene... Okay, um, the sheriff, Roy, has been sort of creating a, uh, a scenario in his mind where there is a shark uh, plying the waters off of uh, Amity Beach uh, in the um, spring break time of the year, um, maybe a little bit later in the season, I guess, Labor Day, I guess, uh, uh, and... They, uh, everybody's worried about the safety of the bathers and the tourists that are coming to town to uh, enjoy the beaches and go, go, go swimming and so forth. Uh, there's been a couple of uh, victims of shark attack. Uh, the young lady in the opening scene of the movie has uh, died and been partially consumed by a predator in the water. And so the sheriff has all of this sort of anxiety uh, built up in his mind about what the possible dangers are that are lurking uh, just off the beach waiting for the um, unsuspecting uh, tourists and bathers that have come to visit his town. And his wife is trying to calm him down, and, and the, the local uh, um, administrators and politicians have been trying to get uh, Roy to sort of, um, sort of step back from his, um, his, his uh, panic a little bit. And, and, and accept the fact that possibly the shark attacks were random and they weren't, um, uh, and they didn't indicate any sort of um, pathology on the part of, um, uh, you know, a, 
a shark out uh, in the waters that is conscious of, of what it's doing um, other than behaving as a typical uh, you know, animal in the wild. Uh, and so Roy has these sort of competing <laughs> anxieties in his, in his brain and, and he's trying to have a nice relaxing uh, moment at the beach with his wife while his, his kids are enjoying the sun and he's just sort of watching everybody enjoying the day and he's trying to relax and, and talk himself out of this moment. And then something happens, an inciting moment, okay? There's some activity out in the water and people are yelling shark and there's going to be a moment where now you know Roy's going to sit up and go no I really I'm right in my fear and my anxiety I'm 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 correct in my suspicions and and here it is we're we're entering this moment right so we could shoot this traditionally right we just have him sit up into the frame or we could just have a wider frame uh, of Roy in the chair like we see here the wife over the shoulder we get a nice little over and we have a conversation and then, oh, the shark, and he looks off camera, right? And then we cut to a wider shot where he maybe stands up and runs towards the water. But instead, uh, what the director wants to achieve here is a moment where we get inside the psychological headspace of the sheriff and feel the moment of tension actually hit him for the first time, right? And he uses a technique that uh, we've sensed uh, come to uh, refer to as the res reverse zoom technique, okay? Uh, and that's going to involve uh, dolly track and a camera support on wheels that will ride on the rails and, and provide a nice glassy move, push in and pull out uh, on a, uh, a dolly in, dolly out translation, okay? And then a zoom lens on the camera. As you can see here, there's a Panavision uh, Primo zoom on the camera. And at the moment that we are going to uh, push in on the lens, we're going to zoom out at the same time to a wide angle. So in essence, what we're going to do is we're going to keep Roy the same size in the frame, but we're going to go from, say, a, a nice telephoto shot of him on the beach. And then as he realizes there's a shark in the water, uh, if we push in and we stayed on that same long lens, uh, we would push into a, essentially push into a close-up and then the focus puller would have to track with the camera and pull the focus into the minimum uh, to keep Roy sharp the whole way, right? Uh, well, he's going to do that anyway, but what we might see in the process is uh, as we're pushing in, in order to keep Roy the same size in the frame, we're going to initiate a zoom out at the same time. So the focus puller is going to be pulling the focus and zooming the lens out from a telephoto to a wide angle at the same time as we decrease the real geography between the camera and Roy sitting in his beach chair, right? And if you remember, we talk about lenses and how long lenses have narrower uh, fields of view that make the background look closer but more out of focus than wide angle lenses, which apparently show the background as uh, looking further away but in sharper focus. And, in contrast to whatever uh, is in the foreground, like our character. And so by pushing in, but keeping Roy the same size, the wide angle effect is going to open up the background behind him, or in the reverse kind of move, we can bring the background right up behind somebody. And in that moment, we get this sort of breathing of the angle of view behind our subject, and we, it creates this moment of, of anxiety where the world is kind of falling away or closing in on our subject. And so either way, we either start close to our actor with a wide angle lens and pull out to a telephoto lens, keeping the character the same size. That'll make the background appear to approach very rapidly up behind our subject, but come further and further out of focus in the process, which creates an isolated point of focus in the foreground of our actor's face. Okay, or the opposite. We start further back on a telephoto and we push into a wide angle angle of view, which will bring the background in sharp clarity, but push it away in the process, which kind of psychologically gives us that sort of adrenaline rush feel uh, that you might uh, experience uh, by doing any number of things, jumping out of an airplane, for instance. All of a sudden, the world is revealed immediately in its its length and breadth, uh, and and everything becomes in super sharp focus because you've just been given, uh, you know, a, a jolt of adrenaline. So I've got this little gif right here that kind of illustrates what that moment looked like in the film. You may remember this; uh, it's a fairly 
uh, popular film at this point. Uh, I'm, I don't know anybody who hasn't seen the film Jaws, but this is the uh, particular moment that I'm talking about, okay? So here's Roy, he's in his chair. The wife is sort of, you know, trying to calm him down, give him a little bit of back rub, relax, baby, it'll be all right. It's, you know, it's not a big bad shark. It's just a couple of random accidents that's unfortunate, but uh, this isn't a pattern, don't worry. And then somebody yells shark and his reality comes crashing down all around him. So I'm gonna activate this GIF for you and I'll just let it run for a couple of seconds and you can see the effect. Okay, so you see how the background is rapidly receding behind him as the moment of realization hits him. Oh my God, it's the shark and it's back. Boom, right? So you see how Roy is staying more or less the same size. He comes into a little bit of a, little bit of a haircut there, but for the most part, he's more or less the same size in the frame, a little bit larger, right? So that we kind of, we kind of frame Marion out at the very end. I think, I think his wife's name is Marion in this movie. Um, we kind of frame her out. We're right up on Roy, right up in his face, and the world is just going whoosh rapidly away from him in, in an adrenaline rush. Okay, so this is the, re, the reverse zoom effect. And this is actually something that was developed by Alfred Hitchcock. Um, you may recall uh, the movie Vertigo, where um, the main character in that film uh, has a fear of heights. And at one point in the film, um, Jimmy Stewart is the character. He's chasing um, the, his mystery woman into a bell tower uh, at a mission um, uh, 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 attraction, tourist stop, whatever, uh, in uh, Northern California. And as he follows her up into the bell tower and we look down with, you know, and we show uh, our character's point of view, the reverse zoom effect is showing the ground and the... Uh, the, the winding staircase all kind of pushing in and pulling away from the point of view shot of Jimmy Stewart. And that is sort of to give us the impression that Jimmy's vertigo is kicking in and he's getting, he's feeling, you know, affected by his uh, fear of heights. And this is the same kind of thing. This is an emotional appeal, this camera move. It's going from normal to wow, adrenaline rush and a big wide angle close up at the same time. It's sort of changing Roy, the shape of Roy's face just a little bit. You can't really tell uh, in this shot so much, but you may recall uh, in our discussion about lenses, wide angle lenses can have an interesting effect on the human face by sort of pulling out and, and projecting some of the uh, prevailing features towards the, towards the lens. So the nose and the chin can become very pronounced on a wide angle close up. Uh, which is generally why we avoid those types of things as often as possible so we don't distort the features of the face and make an actor look uh, abnormally thin, bulbous, uh, you know, accentuate, uh, you know, features of the nose if they're already self-conscious perhaps about the size and shape of their nose. Uh, a wide-angle close-up can be very sort of damaging to those perceptions. So we avoid them unless we want to use it as an emotional sort of effect. And it's, I think it does a really good job here. This is Roy realizing, oh no, the shark is hunting in my waters. He has come back. He does intend to eat more bathers. And this problem is not going to go away on its own, right? All of that realization is happening with this reverse zoom translation. Okay. Okay. The key concept of camera movement what you want to remember about camera movement so that we don't overuse it like any like any other affectation we don't want to overuse camera movement we want to make sure that it's motivated justified in some way and that it's not just superfluous it's not camera movement for movement's sake okay what we don't want to do is is use it a convention or a technique so often that we desensitize our audience to the effect of that thing we're doing, whether it's camera movement or handheld versus tripod work or whether it's, you know, certain kinds of music or, you know, even certain kinds of um, sort of, uh, you know, canned dialogue and so forth. <coughs> Excuse me, whatever it is, we don't want to Desense our, desensitize our audience. So when we move the camera, we generally like it to be motivated by something. So um, 
we can um, motivate the camera from a couple of different points of view. Okay, it can be simply to follow the action, or it can be used as a, like I said, as a tool to communicate non-verbally an emotional shift in the tempo or the tone of our story. Okay, uh, it can also be used um, as a subjective expository uh, method of introducing the audience to new pieces of information as the story unfolds excuse me, unfolds, right? So that we become more immersed in uh, the action of the story instead of being, you know, back on an omnipotent wide-angle lens all the time, knowing more than the actors know and knowing the story before it unfolds. Sometimes camera movement can bring us into the story as the audience immerse us in what's going on and we get to discover aspects of the story, key points and details along with the characters in the film. And that can help us with our suspension of disbelief and, and other things that are uh, involved in the um, effective uh, cinematic experience. Okay, so um, the start and end of camera moves that are motivated by subject movement um, require a certain sensitivity and timing, okay? Um, your starts and your stops want to be uh, timed well, choreographed well with the actions and motivations of the characters, right? So in other words, if you're gonna follow a character from point A to point B in the frame, uh, what we don't wanna do is get the jump on our actor and start moving the camera before our, act our, our actor actually physically starts their move or their walk. Um, we refer to that as sort of telegraphing the move, uh, and that sort of lifts the veil a little bit um, in terms of what's happening uh, in the in, in the unfolding of the story. It takes the can take the audience out of that moment if the camera starts moving before the act, actor is actually moving. Um, so what we want to do is time our takeoffs and ramp up to full speed in the move, and then we want to feather our start our starts and stops so that we don't jerk the camera uh, as we start our move or end our move. We don't want to crash land and we don't want to jerk into motion uh, that will startle the audience or, you know, emotionally take us out of that moment. <clears throat> All right. So today, part one is going to involve the tripod and a handheld movement. Okay, so I want to start with the tripod. I've actually uh, brought a couple tripods uh, in today uh, for the lecture. Um, I brought uh, one of mine from home. This is a, a Manfrotto 516. This is a, an older head uh, with a very uh, high uh, load capacity. This is one of the um, Liebig tripods that uh, uh, that you folks have here in your operational uh, department, your um, equipment room, uh, that you can use for uh, some of your uh, projects. Some of the lighter cameras, um, this isn't a very heavy duty tripod, it has maybe a six or eight pound practical payload, uh, where this, this tripod back here has uh, a 25 pound payload capability, so you can put a much bigger, heavier build or camera rig on this tripod. Uh, and then there's a couple of intermediate uh, tripods available for you as well. There's uh, some Manfrotto, uh, I think you guys have some 502s or 503s back there, uh, which will take on a little bit more weight. So your Ursa Minis uh, built out, you're probably going to want to go with the 502 or the 503 option and take the Liebeck out maybe for your Panasonic uh, FC1000s or your Canon 5Ds or your Canon 60Ds for instance. Uh, your DSLRs, in other words, uh, might want to go on these smaller heads. The tripod itself has, like I said, has been around almost from the inception of the film camera, and it was uh, it was actually conceived for a very specific moment in time, uh, which was let me see if I can find the detail here. Um, around, uh, I think it was 1907, uh, or right around the turn of the century, um, the tripod uh, fluid head was designed um, so that the uh, cameras could um, photograph 
uh, the coronation of um, one of the royals at the time who was ascending the throne in uh, England, I believe it was. And um, so up to that point, uh, motion picture cameras had sort of been bolted in place, right? Um, one, of the, uh, one of the early types of filmmaking that were being done when we were just starting to understand what motion pictures uh, will do for us and what, what kind of images they can offer us uh, as an audience. Um, there was a lot of um, work with um, trains. And so they were creating these films where they would bolt a camera to a train and then just sort of, you know, film the train running down the tracks and reveal the countryside and show us all these wonderful vistas and things um, that you could experience if you hopped on the train and took a trip, say, from Southern California to Northern California or, you know, from the East Coast uh, through the mountains uh, to the Midwest or uh, any number of Midwest to the West Coast, any number of uh, available routes that you could experience. And this was all sort of um, in the, um, the, the exhibition stage of, of cinematography uh, where we were sort of just enjoying new points of view of the world at large that uh, were rendered with these cinema cameras. And so the phantom rides, I think they call them, or the, um, you know, the, um, you know, the wonderful vistas, the panoramas, that uh, moving panoramas that you could create uh, by bolting a camera to a train was something that people hadn't seen before. I think you'll understand the same kind of emotional impact um, when you guys use drones for the first time, okay? So, you know, a, a quadcopter with a 4K camera on it, uh, you, you take it out and you operate it with a controller and you send the camera 50 or 100 feet up in the air and you have a gimbal and you have control over what the camera is seeing and you can just sort of fly along the landscape and you enjoy a point of view with that, uh, with that RC quadcopter, for instance, that you don't normally get to see. So imagine at the turn of the last century, uh, folks who had, you know, just barely started uh, seeing these motion pictures, uh, you know, sort of demonstrated for them, revealed to them in their everyday reality. Uh, and then to see, you know, the point of view of a, of a train traveling through, say, traveling through the rocky landscape of, from Nevada to California, let's say. Uh, and all of the beauty and the amazing uh, landscape images uh, that folks would have been seeing for the first time. It's not the kind of thing that uh, they saw in their everyday life. And so the idea is we're using these tools to, you know, to reveal these new points of view to our audience, okay? And the, the tripod was created to sort of give us a little bit more freedom from having to bolt that camera onto something like a train or a car uh, or, you know, the, the railing of a building and just look at a static wide shot of uh, New York City from the top of the highest building at the time. Um, we could take the camera on a tripod, set it up, say, on a sidewalk or in the city street, and we could watch people pass by in front of the lens. We could watch horses and carriages, buggies, cars, uh, people walking, people on bicycles. Um, and if you go on YouTube, you can see a lot of these types of films where folks are restoring um, uh, old footage from turn of the century, New York City, Boston, Paris, um, London. Uh, and you take a look at those images and, and you can see how people were starting to embrace the medium for the first time. And it was thanks to the tripod and then consequently the, uh, the fluid head. So the idea behind the fluid head is that you are going to have camera support that is not only going to hold your camera for you uh, and give it a sturdy base so that you don't have to support it yourself, um, but it's also going to give you through the use of um, oil-filled cartridges and spring tensioners inside this head. It's going to give you um, very smooth pan translations that you can feel has sort of a fluid resistance built into it. As you move the head back and forth, you can, you can feel that resistance. And all it is is, is, is pneumatics. It's oil-filled cartridges that are giving you a little bit of pressure to resist your, your movement so that it's not sort of jerky. Okay, if you take a standard tripod that's meant only for a photographic camera and you put your video camera on it and you try to pan with it, you'll you realize that there's 
it's, it's very difficult to get a smooth sort of pan or, or tilt out of that device because there's no, um, there's no reciprocal tension that can sort of, you know, kind of like isometric exercises do, you know, an equal and opposite resistance that can offer you uh, a tension that you can work against. So the fluid cartridges in these tripods, they're meant to offer you a little bit of um, reciprocal tension to help you feather your pan so that your starts and your stops have a smooth landing and a smooth takeoff and a smooth translation in between. So you can have the, the pan and the tilt have fluid tension built into them so that your translations are nice and easy, delicate, and smooth. Okay, now one of the things that differentiates this little Liebeck tripod, uh, for instance, from the larger Manfrotto that I have over here is going to be the ability to adjust the tension in that tripod head. So if I just sort of bring this over here for a minute and show you uh, underneath the, uh, the mount plate to this uh, tripod, you can see in here there's a, there's a little dial. As you turn that dial clockwise or counterclockwise, you can actually, right now I have no tension built into the tilt function of this tripod. But as I turn that wheel, I start initiating the oil. Actually, I think it's this one, yeah. I start initiating the oil pressure in this tripod to where I go from just the basic spring tension, which is only at the extreme end of the tilt range, to having this sort of increased friction or resistance all the way through my tilt move. And as I turn the, the knob, the adjustment knob here, I can dial in more or less tension so that I get the right kind of resistance and therefore the right degree of smoothness in my tilt, okay? Um, the pan translation also works the same way. So I was, I was actually adjusting the pan fluid head a minute ago. Uh, if as I turn the, uh, the dial in here uh, under the support plate, I'm adding fluid tension to my pan translation now. So my tilt translation and my pan translation now have a prescribed amount of tension dialed in. Uh, and the knob tells me there's a series of numbers on the knobs. And they give me an idea of, this one's plus or minus with arrows, more or less tension dialed into my translation. Okay. So on a tripod that's designed for heavier payloads and a broader variety of professional cameras, you're also going to have the ability to dial in how much tension you have in your pan and your tilt. And that's the beauty of a fluid head. Okay. So let me just tuck these back over here now and uh, continue our discussion here. So we've got two very uh, fundamental translations we're doing with the tripod, the pan and the tilt. Okay, the tilt is a vertical transformation or reveal, and the pan is a horizontal transformation or reveal of information in the frame. Okay. The zoom is an aspect of, of our camera function, and it has to do with the the type of lens that we might be using on our camera. Now, I'm recording this lecture on an Ursa Mini uh, 4.6K, uh, and I happen to have uh, a deuce or a 50 millimeter lens mounted to the camera, okay? So uh, I only have the one perspective from that 50 millimeter lens. It's 50 millimeters, right? It's, it's a prescribed angle of view, and uh, it has a T-stop, minimum T-stop of a, a T1.5. A zoom lens is going to have all those different focal lengths from, say, 20 to 70, for instance, on a DZO zoom, or uh, 18 to 55 on a Fuji uh, cinema zoom, uh, or 30 to uh, 30 to 100 on a, on a uh, Canon cinema zoom. Um, and then you'll have all those focal lengths incorporated into the product and you simply turn, you know, you turn a ring, an adjustment ring on the lens and you can widen out your field of view or uh, increase the magnification ostensibly and narrow the field of view 
uh, you can go from 30 millimeters to 100 millimeters or 105, let's say, and various points in between. Uh, and if you incorporate that zoom while the camera's rolling, you can get that, you know, among other things, the reverse zoom effect that I showed you earlier. While we consider the zoom a type of camera movement, um, as you know now, if you have a zoom lens, let's say that goes from, let's say it goes from 20 to 70, okay? Um, at 20 millimeters, you, you know that a 20 millimeter lens has a, a wide field of view. It has an, ap an appearance of greater depth of field from foreground to background by virtue of being wider. Uh, the backgrounds appear further away in the distance, uh, uh, separated from the foreground. Uh, and then on the opposite end of the, the zoom scale, the 70 millimeter is going to possess all the characteristics of a telephoto lens, narrower field of view, uh, the background will appear closer to the subject, but more out of focus, um, exponentially so. Uh, and so if you expedite a zoom from 20 millimeter to 70 millimeter in the same shot, you're going to see all that change of perspective and depth of field that happens between those two different focal lengths. That can be very distracting to your audience because not only are you changing the size of the character within the frame, okay, but you're also changing the amount of focus in front of and behind the character. You may or may be creating or destroying a central point of focus as a result of that, and you're changing the field of view of the lens. So on a 20 millimeter where you see your subject in the foreground and some people in the middle ground and maybe some buildings and trees in the background, and then you zoom into 70 millimeter, all of a sudden, you don't see very many of those details anymore because the field of view has changed. It's been thrown radically out of focus at the same f-stop that you might have used on the 20 millimeter lens. And the focal point has totally shifted from the overall frame to one element in the foreground, whether that's a character or an object or whatever. Okay, And so that can be sort of jarring for the audience. This is where camera movement comes into play. If you can move the camera on the same focal length, but start further away and then simply move closer to your subject, you can change the relative size of your subject by decreasing or increasing the distance from the camera to the subject by virtue of your move on whatever device you're using. But the characteristics of the lens will stay the same. So if you start back here on a 50 millimeter and you zoom into me, Okay, or you, not zoom, I'm sorry. If you push into me on a dolly, right, we're still on the 50 millimeter lens, so it still has the same style of depth of field. The angle of view might change a little bit by virtue of the closing of the distance between us, right, from far away to closer up, but it remains, for the most part, the same. Okay, and the only thing that has to be adjusted for that kind of a move is the focus, right? So the focus polar will simply go from your number one, which might be, say, 20 feet away, to the number two, which might be five feet away. The subject will get larger in the frame as a result of getting 15 feet closer, but the depth of field will stay the same. The focal length feel, in other words, the way objects look rendered at 50 millimeters will basically be the same. Uh, there, in other words, there won't be any uh, there won't be any warping or, or distortion um, from going from a telephoto to a wide angle. It's the same perspective, 50 millimeters. And aspects of the background might change a little bit, but the angle of view will still be the same. So we'll be able to ch close the distance without altering the focal photometric quality of the image, right? If you do that on a zoom, all those other things are coming into play. And it can have a, a radical effect on how your audience is taking in the information, and then perceiving your story. Uh, okay, so the tripod was the first uh, type of camera support beyond, the, uh, beyond mounting to trains and things. Uh, the first sort of camera support that was invented uh, once the camera was perfected and we were ready to use it in the field. Um, the tripod itself, it's three adjustable legs. Um, these two tripods, for instance, this guy here is up about as high as he'll go. This guy will go up about another uh, 14 inches to about, to about here, okay? So 
uh, the size of the tripod is going to have an effect on the overall height, the amount of payload that it can support, um, and it might also have, um, you know, the, the, the bigger the tripod or the taller a tripod can get, it might have a larger base diameter, um, which changes your footprint on set, okay? So there might be uh, reasons why you don't want the biggest tripod, for instance, or the tallest tripod you can get your hands on, because the footprint of the tripod might be, you know, four or five feet in diameter, which may not be an effective use of space if you're in a very tight uh, set of circumstances. Um, tripods are intended to be used for video or filmmaking. The fluid head is the camera support that makes our pans and our tilts possible with, um, uh, with precision. And then of course uh, there are things called monopods. Uh, here's a picture of one here. Uh, it's not an effective stabilization tool like a tripod is. Tripod has three legs. You can mount your camera to it and you can stand away from it if you have to. You can go talk to your actors, you can come back and you can readdress the camera and the camera will stay in the same place you left it, presuming that you lock it down and it's on stable footing. The monopod, on the other hand, is something that you use for stability, but you can't let go of it because it's only got one leg, <laughs> okay? So you might use this um, if you are, you know, you're walking around, uh, you, you'll notice, for instance, at football games, uh, photographers and videographers often use monopods uh, because if there's a gaggle of uh, people at one end of the football field trying to photograph the guy making the end zone run, right, 15 or 20 tripods can't get into a tight bunch and everybody get a similar angle, right? All the different networks, everybody's looking for basically the same shot. Uh, you can all get in there on a monopod and you can get some stability of your frame so it's not, you know, really kind of bouncing around, especially if you have to zoom in a little bit to get a better, tighter frame. Uh, and you can get a little bit more stability of frame by having at least one leg underneath supporting the camera and taking the weight for you so that as, as the camera gets heavier, as you stand there holding it for seconds that turn into minutes, that turn into moments, you know, uh, you don't get that sort of shaky uh, frame that'll happen uh, as your muscles start, um, you know, running out of oxygen. So a monopod is nice for basic support, but don't walk away from it because <laughs> it doesn't, uh, it, it won't hold up on its own. The, uh, the hi-hat is a device that we use. Um, we can take the fluid head off of our tripod. If the tripod's too tall for what we're doing, for instance, we can take our tripod off of the legs and we can mount it onto uh, one of these uh, devices called the hi-hat. So you have a lockdown screw and you have the fluid head itself and it's got a 3816 uh, female uh, thread on the bottom of the head and then a 3816 uh, male thread on the lockdown screw. Okay, And then the bottom of the tripod you'll see has sort of a semi-round uh, uh, quality about it that's designed, you know, part A into part B. That the top of the tripod has a bowl that's designed to receive the uh, the half round or the um, uh, the ball head uh, portion of the uh, fluid head, and that creates the linkage. Right. Well, all you need is that same sort of compatibility with your hi hat. Okay, and you can get the tripod mounted say to uh, maybe to a, a, a pancake or an apple box uh, uh, and you can get that tripod head way down close to the floor so if you wanted a, a low angle shot looking up for instance uh, you'll notice a lot of the nfl uh, cameramen use the hi-hat uh, support because uh, gets them low down to the field especially the guys that are down by the end zone and they've got the pylon uh, perspective where they're looking right down the uh, the end zone line, right? And they got that low angle so you can see the end zone line. You can see the pylon in the foreground and you're waiting for the, the angle where the, the tailback jumps over the, the line of scrimmage, uh, you know, and gets that, you know, dramatic arcing leap into the end zone, right? They get those low angle shots that way. Um, it's a point of view that's uh, very dramatic and interesting for the audience. It, you don't want to do it for everything, um, but there are moments where that makes sense. And so depending on the size of your tripod, this one is 75 millimeter. Okay, 75 millimeters on the small side of the sort of AB compatibility of these tripods. They go from 75, actually they go from 65 millimeter 
all the way up to 150 millimeter for some of the professional uh, tripods that use the what we call the claw ball method of, of connectivity uh, between the fluid head and the tripod. Um, this heavy tripod that I brought in is bolted directly to the pedestal support on the tripod. So this one's not meant to come off, it's bolted permanently on the legs. Uh, but I do have additional Manfrotto 516 heads that have 100 millimeter connectivity, okay? So 100 millimeter uh, ball head. Uh, and then I have 100 millimeter uh, high hat. I have 100 millimeter short legs, 100 millimeter tall legs. Uh, and then I have 100 millimeter receivers for things like my cranes and my jibs uh, and my camera mounts. Okay, so if I want to put a fluid head on, say a hood mount on a car and do a running shot, uh, I can do that. I can mount the fluid head on and use it to sort of get my frame the way I want it and then lock everything off on the hood mount and then, you know, run off with the camera on the front of the car and get the shot through the windshield, for instance. So this is all about connectivity connectivity between your fluid head and other devices that you're going to use for support. Uh, standard legs, high legs, baby legs, or high hats. Okay. Other kinds of devices that kind of help us. This is a, this is a tilt plate. So you have a certain amount of tilt range uh, that you can achieve with these devices, right? So once you tilt that head about as far over as it's going to go, you notice this one won't tilt completely 90 degrees. Uh, you might want to use a tilt wedge mounted to the tripod head, and then your camera is mounted to it so that you can tilt the, the tripod all the way as far as it'll go, lock that, and then take the rest of the tilt on the tilt plate and get a perfectly straight down point of view, let's say, down the side of a building. Uh, if you were going to shoot, uh, you know, Mission Impossible, where uh, Tom Cruise is um, uh, scaling the building on the outside of the building over in uh, Abu Dhabi, right? And we're looking down, and uh, he's climbing up towards the camera. We're looking straight down, right? You can do that on a crane. You can do that locked off on a, a rig that just simply looks down the side of the building. There's lots of different things, reasons you might want to do that kind of a shot. The tilt plate is a really handy tool to help you with that, uh, uh, you know, to create that point of view. Uh, this is what we call a, a, a rocker wedge. Uh, and this is simply, if you need to get even lower than what you can get with the hi-hat, if you notice here, uh, these are to scale, but it's kind of hard to tell what their actual size is. This measurement right here is about eight inches, okay? So imagine that you've got your fluid head now mounted to this thing. You've got eight inches plus maybe another inch, so nine inches off the floor is where your, uh, your receiver is. And then your head's another, say, five or six inches tall. Nine and six is 15 inches. And then you get 60 millimeters of draw between the center of your lens and your 15 millimeter rod base plate. 60 millimeters is a little over two inches, okay? So 15, 17 and a half inches. So with a high hat, your lens is gonna be about this high off the floor. With the rocker wedge, you can get your, your lens about this high off the floor. So, and you have a little bit of tilt capability. You can put this on an Apple box um, and sort of tilt up if you have to, to follow the action a little bit. But you can get that lens way, way down close to the floor with a little bit of operable capability that you wouldn't have, for instance, if you just put the camera on a sandbag. You'd be about the same height off the floor at that point but you can't really operate a camera very well on a sandbag, whereas with a rocker plate or a rocker wedge, uh, you have you know, a little bit of tilt up and tilt down. Um, and we used to get really clever with our tilt wedges. Uh, we would take a tra we'd go, go to the craft service uh, uh, guy and get a trash bag and put, a, uh, put it on top of an apple box and it would make kind of a slick surface on that apple box and we could put the tilt wedge on the trash bag, put the camera on that and get a little bit of a tilt out of it. You know, not much, but just, just a little bit. If you need to just pan the camera a little bit to follow the action and tilt up a little, you can get about that much out of a tilt wedge with a trash bag on an apple box and it, and it works really well, okay? Whatever you've got to do to get that lens where you need it to be, right? If you need that lens over here, over here, down here, up here, whatever you got to do to get it there, camera support is what you're going to rely on. 
The grip department generally helps us out with these types of uh, tasks. Uh, they are not only working with the lighting crew in terms of shaping light and helping us diffuse and shape and cut light, they're also working with the camera department to work with camera supports to help uh, our camera fans get the lens in the spot that they need it to get the shot that we, uh, that the director is asking us for. Okay, so, okay. The panning translation and the tilting translation are our fundamental tripod translations. Okay. Um, I think we've pretty well talked this point out. So I will leave this uh, frame for you to investigate on your own uh, by checking out the PDF of this lecture. Uh, you can download it uh, on the PDFs page of your homepage. One uh, point off of this whole slide that I do want to uh, call your attention to is panning speed. Okay. This is something that. Uh, a lot of folks experience, they, they make an error with their panning speed uh, when they're first starting out and um, you get a strange effect on your image that appears like the image is strobing as you pan across, uh, say, a wide frame. Say you go to the lake and there's a regatta happening, so there's a bunch of boats out on the water and they're sailing around and you want to just sort of pan across the the playing field and get a look at all the different boats that are out there sailing on the water. But if you pan too fast, your image can actually look like it's strobing, right? And so that strobing effect is where the camera motion that's happening uh, is happening. There's a, there's a moment that happens while the frame is refreshing, right? Uh, where movement takes place. And as a result, if your movement, if your pan movement is faster than your refresh rate, your image can appear to be strobing. So we have a rule of thumb when we're using fluid heads and tripods and any device basically that we're panning. If we're, pan, if we're doing a long pan, if the pan angle, if the view of the pan angle is 120 degrees, okay, that pan, that whole move over 120 degrees should take you no less than seven seconds. If you go any faster than seven seconds, you're gonna get that stroby look in your image, right? But 120 degrees is about this far, from about here to about here. That's a good look at the horizon, for instance. So 120 degrees, count it out. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, 1,005, 1,006, 1,007, 1,008. Okay, that was an eight second pan and that would be stable enough to where your image wouldn't have that flickery jaggy effect to it okay so the minimum is seven seconds okay I'm more comfortable with eight sometimes nine seconds if there's a lot of detail the more detail in the frame the slower your pan should be okay uh, because you'll see that difference uh, that motion artifacting in the in the form of uh, the stroby or juddery uh, uh, frame okay and that'll be because you're panning too fast all right so that's something that uh, I wanted to make sure I covered with you guys uh, because it's very important in fact it's uh, it's featured prominently uh, as a concern in the um, the cinematographer's handbook okay that's uh, put out by the uh, American Society of Cinematographers every few years uh, and one of the um, the rules or guidelines in the um, the camera operator section of the ASC manual is panning speeds and panning speeds can be affected by focal length uh, they can be affected by uh, camera support um, and they can be affected by uh, things like lens height um, and sometimes by the format uh, that you're shooting whether it's um, 16 millimeter 35 millimeter or 65 millimeter film or whether you're shooting, you know, uh, uh, HD video, 4K video, or something bigger, 6 or 8K video, okay? Sometimes the format that you're using can also have an effect on your panning speeds, okay? Because your focal lengths become relative to that, that format, okay? Um, I have a couple of GIFs here that are going to show you just um, 
very quickly the, the idea that the, the panning camera is designed to follow the action, right? You're picking up the actor at some point and moving them to another point in the frame, showing us new information as the camera moves from setup or number one to number two, okay? We are actually following the action uh, and revealing new information to our audience, okay? Uh, tilting is the same kind of demonstration, but it's on the vertical axis now. So when we're tilting the camera, the same sort of thing is happening. We're starting at a low angle, tilting up, or starting at a high angle, tilting down. We're revealing something or showing movement from high to low or from bottom to top, okay? We start on the sidewalk of two people going into uh, a building on uh, you know, Fifth Avenue in New York City, and then we tilt up to reveal what building they just entered, right? That was, that's a fairly common shot from some of the old movies of the 50s and 60s, right? Um, even now, even today, we still use that kind of exploratory framing to establish where our actors are coming and going from, okay? And that's a fairly common one. Um, what else have we got here? Check out this video on web courses. This is from our friends at Shutterstock. And this is, uh, I think his name is Robbie, and he's going to talk to you about panning and tilting the fluid head tripod and give you uh, a lot of the same information that I have uh, been covering here in this lecture. So here's our Ursa Mini. Uh, this is uh, pretty much identical to the camera I'm shooting myself with now. Uh, here we have our, our uh, camera operator and uh, looks like he's on a set of baby legs here uh, with a Sackler fluid head tripod um, and he's using the eyepiece, the electronic viewfinder. Sometimes when you pan the camera you can either use the screen on the back of your camera uh, and effectively watch the screen almost like you'd watch TV and operate like so. Sometimes it's, it's actually nice to use the electronic viewfinder and put your eye right to the eyepiece so that you have an exclusive look at the frame with no other distracting information around you that you can, that you can, uh, that you can see. And just look through the viewfinder and watch the action through the viewfinder. And it gives you a sense of what the image would look like on a screen if it was, you know, maybe, let's say, in a dark room in a theater. Okay, so handheld now is a mode that we want to go to, uh, particularly if we want to start injecting a little bit of drama into uh, our story, okay? The handheld frame is going to have a little bit of inherent motion in it because there's nothing but the human body stabilizing that frame, okay? And so depending on how we choose to hold the camera, right, uh, may create or reduce the amount of dynamic frame movement that is uh, inherent in that method of, of stabilization, okay? Um, it's the kind of thing that we don't want to do all the time. That little bit of dynamic frame movement can translate psychologically into um, feelings or uh, emotions uh, that translate to our audience, like um, feelings of anxiety, um, the dynamic slightly uh, moving frame has a sort of a voyeuristic appeal to it. So if we want to, for instance, simulate the POV of someone watching the action from a dis uh, disclosed or, or, or uh, an undisclosed rather uh, position, like um, the voyeur in the bushes watching the two lovers on the park bench, right? That little bit of dynamic frame movement is sort of a, a nonverbal cue to the audience that this is the point of view of somebody who's watching, um, you know, from an, un an, an unavoided position, uh, an uninvited position, I should say. Um, so it's, it's kind of a unique aspect that we don't want to overuse. Again, we don't want to desensitize our audience to um, the emotions that can be elicited by that slight bit of sort of anthropomorphic movement that we can introduce into the frame, okay? Um, <clears throat> handheld is going to give us greater freedom to move around. A handheld camera can help us expedite uh, virtually any of the rudimentary tra translations that I discussed in the beginning of this video, okay? You can move in and move out with a handheld camera. You can boom up and boom down with a handheld camera. You can 
create autonomous movement with a handheld camera. You can pan and you can tilt with a handheld camera. You can do all the stuff you can do on devices with a handheld camera. But again, if you overuse the dynamic aspect of the framing by going handheld, you can desensitize your audience to the types of things that are possible if you only use handheld in purposeful moments, okay? Tight lenses with handheld framing in uh, a horror movie, let's say. Like, I love to use Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the 2003 version, uh, in a lot of my classes because I think uh, Daniel Pearl did an amazing job with that movie. And there are moments in that movie that when you're on a narrow lens and the frame is just a little bit jerky, right? that can raise the anxiety level of your audience, right? Especially if they, if they know that Leatherface is lurking somewhere in the dark and the kids are trying to get to safety, they're trying to get to their van or they're trying to get out of the house, right? And we don't know where Leatherface is gonna jump out from. And so following them handheld with a tight frame that's moving a little bit, giving us sort of that sense of the voyeuristic, like maybe it's Leatherface's point of view, watching them from the shadows and he's just picking his moment when he wants to jump out and tackle them. Okay, that's something you can get with a handheld camera that you won't get on a stable device like a tripod, okay? So remember that, remember that there's a purposeful reason to go handheld and try not to overuse it. Here's an interesting shot. I think I can show you uh, on the screen here, I think the image is big enough. Um, you can also access this video uh, on YouTube, it's where I pulled it from. It's from Birdman, 2014 uh, feature film directed by uh, Alejandro uh, Iñárritu. And this is uh, shot by uh, Emmanuel Lubetsky. Um, won the Academy Award uh, Best Cinematography uh, in its year as well. Uh, this is where Michael Keaton has, um, he's left the theater. Um, He's left uh, the package store. He picked up a bottle. He's sort of sipping it on the sidewalk as he walks uh, home. He's thinking he's got a lot of things going through his mind. Uh, this guy is an actor who is kind of a, he's, he's somebody that's always hanging around the theater, always looking for, um, you know, work and, and um interaction with uh, other actors he might be we, it suggested that he might be a little bit touched uh through his anxiety and his depression and his uh, over uh over anxious need to be a part of this uh, whole experience this acting experience uh, and in this scene he happens to be out uh hanging off of some uh, roadwork scaffolding that was on the sidewalk uh, around the block from the theater and michael keaton's going to walk by and they're going to have a brief sort of interaction and then Michael's gonna continue walking down the sidewalk. He's in his own head at this point. He's wondering if he's made a lot of bad decisions and spent all of his uh, hard-earned money that he, w that he made as a, an actor on superhero movies uh, to fund his own um, dramatic uh, narrative uh, play that he has written the script for, or translated the script for, I guess. And um, he sunk a lot of money into this project. He wants to show the world that he's, he can be a real actor. And he's got all of this angst and all of this emotion in, in his head. And in that moment, he's, he's trying to self-medicate. And he's encountering this guy, and he's walking out on, uh, on the streets uh, at night trying to get some air. So here's just the sense of the shot using handheld uh, as the method of stabilization. So I guess I don't have any audio here. Um, but here's our guy, right? So they have a brief exchange, and you can see how the camera frame is, is moving just enough to feel like we might be walking down the sidewalk with Mike as he's drinking his whatever, his <laughs> Mad Dog 2020 or his, you know, his, uh, <laughs> his um, Mad Dog or whatever he's got in the bag there. Um, he sits down, we follow him, we take a low angle looking up, we kind of see uh, how he feels in a wide angle close up, and then he's going to look up off camera and we're going to look at what he sees. The camera's going to tilt away and that's a transition shot to, another, to, a, the, to the scene that comes next. Okay? So the whole idea was the handheld camera was the best way to start inside the theater backstage 
follow Keaton out the back door of the stage, down the sidewalk to the package store, where he goes inside and picks up a bottle of booze, and then pays and walks out with it and starts walking down the sidewalk towards his house. And that whole time, we can't be on a crane because the crane has a fixed base, and even if it's on wheels, uh, we can't walk down the sidewalk with it, up the stairs and out the back door of the theater, uh, over all the bumps, nooks, and crannies of a New York City sidewalk. I don't know if you've ever been there, but it can be a very irregular surface. Into a package store, back out of a package store, and then down two or three blocks uh, away and around a corner, right? We can't do all of that on devices that might need rails or leveled platforms uh, or surfaces to roll on or... Uh, we can maybe do that with a steady cam, but a long walk on a steady cam is going to tucker out your camera operator and you're only going to get, you know, a couple of uh, rehearsals and maybe a couple of takes out of him before uh, you're going to, your, your camera operator, your steady cam operator is going to run out of gas. Okay. So handheld seemed to make the most sense. And the fact that it had a little bit of bounce in it, a little bit of autonomous movement or a little bit of anthropomorphic translation, Right. It gave us the it gave it immerses the audience. It makes us feel like we're walking with Michael as he sorts out all of his troubles down the sidewalk. Right. And then when it comes time to, you know, take that that transition shot that's going to take us to the next scene, uh, we just sort of just sort of float off of him and just start floating up into uh, whatever this is, the street light or whatever. OK. And it's a very nice it's a very nice way to render the scene. It has an organic feel to it, right? This movie is predominantly handheld, okay? They go from handheld to steady cam to um, assisted handheld uh, with a rig I'm going to show you in a few minutes. Uh, a number of different devices to sort of limit how much shake is happening. A couple of times they're on techno crane, okay? So, but this camera is always moving in this movie and they're always trying to keep the movement fresh by not overusing one particular kind of uh, device or translation so that we don't start boring the audience, essentially. Here's a uh, couple of shots that show you the, um, the evolution of handheld cameras, okay? So here's a press camera from probably the Second World War era. This looks like it might be uh, uh, an IMO, Bell & Howell IMO camera. Uh, this happens to be Robert Kappa. Uh, he's a pretty famous uh, movie director uh, from the 40s and 50s. And uh, this little camera would hold 100-foot uh, loads. It was designed for press photographers who were taking uh, shots uh, for the newsreels for the folks back home that were going to the movies every, every weekend. Um, and you could see the newsreels before every feature. The IMO was... Uh, specifically designed for that kind of work. You could bolt it to the wings of airplanes so you get all the allied uh, films of the, the, the dog fights and, and things that were happening over Europe uh, during the Second World War. You can get a lot of interesting um, press-related short um, film clips that they would incorporate into the newsreels. This is an Aton Minima camera, I believe. And this is Mark During Powell. Oh, no, it's an Airy 235. I'm sorry. This is Mark During Powell, and uh, he's using a handheld on the set. Uh, and you can see how the camera is sort of, the way it's built, it sort of is integrated into its own shoulder pad. And then you have a couple of uh, uh, accessory handles that you can attach to the camera to give you steering control over the camera itself. And then, of course, you got your lens mounted to the front. He's got a viewfinder. He's got his eye to the viewfinder. And then this bulge on the back is the film magazine. Okay, that's something the digital cameras don't possess at this point. Um, but the film magazine, actually, the way it was mounted uh, off the back of the camera like that, provided a nice little sort of counterweight to whatever the lens was doing in the front that you had to support with your two hands. So that was, this is kind of the evolution of a handheld camera. And now, in this day and age, you can see how the digital cameras are sort of following the same uh, protocols, right? So here is uh, a Panasonic 4K uh, video camera. Uh, this is Matt from NewsShooter.com, uh, and he's got the Panasonic DVX200, and he's just sort of holding it in his hands, and he's got the electronic viewfinder on the back side, or a swing-out monitor that he can look at on the side of the camera, and, and he can just sort of hold it out in front of him. The camera doesn't weigh but a couple, three, four pounds, and that's not terribly heavy to hold out in front of you for a minute or two if you've got to get a, you know, a shot, and you just want to sort of support it with your, with your arms tucked under you like that, and just sort of hold it right 
if you got a small camera that you just want to sort of support like so and take your shot right and get a monitor on the back I can swing it out and look at it here and just sort of hold it and hold it on my subject and and get a nice stable shot but the bigger the camera gets the more you might need a device to help you support that load so here's a Ursa Mini 4.6k again this is Tom Antos uh, and he's got a 4.6k Ursa Mini he has the integrated shoulder pad that is the also the rod support for the camera and then he's got a what we call a dog bone extension uh, for the rosette uh, where the handle would normally go on the side of the camera either here or here and you can extend the handle out to a more ergonomically comfortable place to support that camera through the use of the dog bone and of course he's got a, a firm grip on the front of the mat box on the other side and maybe he can hold his his focus wheel or the mat box and just sort of steer that camera around like so and support the weight of the camera on his shoulder okay so this is sort of a traditional handheld uh, posture for a digital camera now so uh, you can use the airy uh, alexas this way you can use the uh, obviously the ursa minis this way you can use the red cameras this way um, there's a number of larger cameras the panasonic uh, varicams uh, are also uh, shoulder integratable cameras and uh, uh, it's very convenient to be able to throw the camera on your shoulder and have your shoulder support that way you'll notice the news guys have been doing it for decades Right. It's just, you know, if you get to stand there and hold that camera for a long time, your legs become your your camera support, your shoulder becomes your base. And you just have you just need a couple of handles to help stabilize the whole thing. And you can hold that frame fairly steady. Right. For fairly long periods of time, a couple, two, three minutes at the max, I would think is about a practical amount of time. Right. And you can get some nice shots this way. It's very quick. It's easy. Um, and you can move through a lot of uh, material very quickly if uh, if you're using a handheld camera now for cameras that don't particularly lend themselves to that kind of shoulder application like this is a panasonic uh, fc 1000 all right it's designed more with the ergonomics of a dslr or a mirrorless camera as this one is and it's designed to be held out here you put the camera up to your eye like a photo camera of, of you know not so long ago and this is kind of the modus operandi for this, this ergonomic style of camera body, right? But if you wanted to build this out with an external monitor, right, with an external large capacity battery, uh, some handles out front and so forth, you could get a rod rig, integrated uh, shoulder pad, and you could build this camera out to function the way the Ursa Mini was doing in that other shot. Um, it's very possible. There's also devices uh, that offer the same kind of flexibility, uh, but without all the gadgets and, and pieces that you have to assemble a la carte from a website like Small Rig, for instance, or uh, from Red Rock or uh, Zacuto or, or websites like that. You can get something like this. This is the uh, uh, Burns and Sawyer shoulder rig, and it has a quick release plate on it, just like the uh, tripods would use, right? So you can take your tripod plate off the rig and mount it on the bottom of your camera and you can click in and click out of this handheld rig, but it offers shoulder support, right? This is adjustable height wise. Uh, the base, the carriage of this thing can adjust in and out. And I can also adjust the angle and attitude of these handles out front. And this gives me a nice stable platform from which to operate a camera using my shoulder and my legs to support everything and holding tucking my elbows in and holding this thing so that my frame doesn't move around a lot if i was just sort of holding the camera out in space without the assistance of any of this hardware right it helps me with a much more stable platform right just like so and this can work very well if you have long takes but you want your film to have sort of a handheld feel, right? Here's your autonomous or your yaw movement, your tilting, right? Your panning, and then of course your dolly in and dolly out, right? And your lateral tracking, right? Just sort of pivot on your feet, and you can even start walking if you had to. You can get the effects of a slider 
just by holding the frame still and just pivoting from left foot to right foot and back again, right? We call this rock and roll. If you're doing music videos and you want to get those shots, maybe the guitarist, right? Down to the strings, up to the face, down to the strings, up to the nut, down to the strings, up to the face, down to the strings, up to the tuning nut, right? Use these a lot on music videos. This is the Burns and Sawyer handheld uh, shoulder rig, okay? Um, there's also devices that are out there that are handy uh, to use. For instance, um, here's one that I like a lot. It's, uh, it's called the Fig Rig. And this is a little bit like having a steering wheel <laughs> and you can hold, again, make a firm base with your elbows, hold the camera out in front of you and use it to control your horizon, right? Keep the camera horizon level and you can still tilt up and tilt down with this thing, crane up and crane down, track, right? Push in pull out, right? You can do all the same things you can do with a shoulder rig, but you've got the device out here in front of you, right? Where your arms can now start adding a little bit or contributing a little bit to the movement, right? It's whatever you're most comfortable with. Um, I like the fig rig. I think it offers a lot of flexibility and uh, it also has quick release plate, just like your tripod and your shoulder rig. So it's very easy to, if you have the same plate on your tripod like I do. I have the same plate system on my tripod that I have on my tilt plates, on my car rigs, on my shoulder rigs, on my fig rigs, on my steady cam, on my gimbals. Okay, they all have the same Manfrotto plate. And if they don't have a Manfrotto receiver and kick plate already integrated into them, uh, I just add it. Okay, like the fig rig doesn't come with the integrated uh, receiver and kick plate, you have to add that as an accessory. So really all it is is a crossbar and then you add the uh, quick release plate system to it and make sure that it's consistent with all your other support devices. And then all you need is one quick release plate mounted to the bottom of your camera. And then you can effectively move from device to device to device by just clicking out of that support and then clicking into the new device that you want to use and you save a lot of time that way. It's very handy to work that way. Uh, I'll just show you that really quick. This is uh, the, the, the feel of this film is Children of Men. Uh, this is another film shot by Emmanuel Lubetsky. The director is Alfonso Caron this time. Uh, this is Children of Men from 2006. And um, this is a post-apocalyptic movie about how uh, men and women can no longer have children. And so if, um, you know, by natural uh, uh, forces and coincidence, if, if somebody happens to have a child, it's a rare occurrence and people, uh, it affects people emotionally and ideologically um, uh, trying to um, restore the, the population of the planet where uh, people are slowly going extinct because they become effectively sterilized by something that was in the air or the water. Um, so the whole movie has kind of a handheld verite style to it. Uh, Emmanuel Lubetsky used a particular device to help him support the weight of the camera. You can see here this is called an easy rig, right? So he had a film camera that he wanted to hand hold, and, but he knew he wasn't going to be able to hold um, an Airy, say an Airy 435 or an Airy 235 or a Panavision uh, Millennium, which uh, at best all stripped down is, is still a, you know, a, a 40 or 50 pound camera. Uh, you can't hold that weight for very long, then you got to put it down. So if your takes are long and your style is the long take method and you're hand holding a film camera, you're going to need something to help you take the weight off your, your arms and hands and shoulders. Uh, and so the Easy Rig was designed with a backpack and a mast and a cabling system that's spring loaded under tension that can actually help support the camera by just sort of holding it in space in front of you and then all you have to do is basically sort of steer the camera around and it will support the weight of the camera by translating the 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 heft of it to your back on that backpack and your legs then become 
the shock absorbers and the and the overall support for the whole system and all your hands end up becoming are basically the means of steering the lens around okay and this is a very effective tool that he used to get the feel the look and feel of the movie uh, children of men so here's a little snippet from children of men you can sort of see how from the very beginning the frame has some autonomous movement happening some shaky cam okay and as he pushes in on our character here right uh, sitting in the uh, in, in the bus or in the, the uh, 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 subway car uh, we get a sense of the move but it's it's sort of shaky the whole way okay it's the idea of immersing the audience in the film and making us part of the experience of this film okay there's a lot of long takes in children of men um, that are several minutes long and there would have been no way that uh, Emmanuel Lebesky could have handheld the camera for those extended periods without the help of the easy rig so the easy rig was sort of the right invention at the right time to make this film with its particular specific sort of uh, content uh, creation possible okay there would have been it would have been very very hard there, there wouldn't be on any long takes possible right it would have been very very difficult and probably take twice as long to make this movie if after every couple of takes we had to let our camera operator rest because they were just plumb tuckered out from having to support such a heavy camera with their bare hands okay this is a good film if you haven't seen it already I highly recommend checking it out um, this again was from 2006 there were some very interesting um, and innovative camera moves and camera rigs that came out of this film uh, the scene where they go 360 degrees uh, inside the car while the car is running down the road uh, was a particular uh, achievement that was unique uh, to this film uh, we've done it since in films like um, I think they've done it now in the Born Supremacy and, and movies like that. Um, but this was kind of breaking ground back in that time. Um, very interesting uh, looking film. So what are we talking about here? There's an endless variety of ways to move the camera, okay? Camera movement in filmmaking has a lot of complex facets. Like I said, we're going to be talking about this for the next three, three or four weeks, okay? So there's an endless variety of ways to move the camera. Uh, it, it is useful to take a look at a few of the basic categories or types of movement to provide a good general vocabulary uh, of the dynamics that are, that are taking place. Um, the most fundamental of the camera moves, the pan, uh, the tilt, um, and the zoom in and zoom out can be done with the most rudimentary uh, tools. Okay. Uh, and they can be accomplished in almost any mode that we're going to talk about from here on out and handheld uh, being the least of those. Um, so we're going to continue our exploration. Uh, we're going to add tracking shots, following shots, leading shots, pushing in and pulling out or dolly shots into our discussion. Uh, each week I'm going to show you two or three new tools that will help you achieve these translations uh, in a variety of ways okay and there there will be advantages to each one of those translations each one of those tools okay and hopefully you'll start to notice the difference let's say between a dolly in and a dolly out handheld and a dolly in and a dolly out on a studio dolly right and a tilt up and a tilt down handheld and a, and a boom up and a boom down on a jib okay or what does it feel like to be handheld with a camera following an actor around a set and being on a steady cam with its glassy sort of gliding movement or on a handheld gimbal where the move is very smooth and very glassy okay these are the types of observations i'm going to i'm hoping that you're going to start making and some of the correlations you're going to be starting to to make between these different tools so next week i'm going to talk to you about the dolly the camera slider and the pocket or travel jib, okay? Um, so be prepared for that conversation and you can do so by checking out the reading assignments. 
uh, check out the PDFs. Okay, Laura Wells and uh, the the, uh, the the folks from um, where are they here? I can give you the uh, uh, Cinematography Theory and Practice. I'm sorry, the uh, the third edition. So the chapter on camera movement from the Brown book. Okay, and then the art of uh, camera movement by Laura Wells. And then remember, there's that other PDF that I have, the five most powerful camera movements in cinema history. Okay, you want to check that one out as well. That one is the, uh, the offering from, I'll show it to you really quick, from the Premium Beat folks on their website. Okay, and this is an interesting article. It's not too long, but it gives you some nice contemporary examples of the camera movement and what we're talking about and uh, some of the tools that you can use to achieve those those results okay so this is a pretty good article for you to check out as well all right so that's what's coming up okay enjoy uh your work from home time and uh, again if uh, if i have any individuals that um, uh, don't have uh, proper access to internet uh, services please let me know so we can work out some way of getting you these materials um, and keep up with your reading. Uh, your next quiz will be uh, on the, where's my schedule here? On the 30th, okay, it's quiz five, and that's gonna be um, on your composition and framing and your coverage basics. And then we'll have another quiz on the 13th of April covering your camera movement, and then your final exam will be coming up at the end of the month. Okay, so thanks so much for tuning in this week to this lecture. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the content. Reach out to me with an email if you have any questions or concerns about any of the topics that I've covered today. And uh, I'll see you next week uh, for our part two discussion on camera movement. Thanks so much.